we will start recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Keeping Up with the Ambassadors. We have a new guest today. Hello, Xenia. Hello. So just a little context for those of you that don't know, Keeping Up with the Ambassadors is a series with the goal of um, asking our ambassadors what, they, what they're doing these days and how their life after MS is going and also trying to discuss some topics of global relevance. And just to add a little bit more context, the, ambassador, the ambassadorship is a program offered by the Charney Resolution Center in collaboration with the Eastern Mediterranean International School. And the goal of, of it is basically to involve MS alumni by making them be ambassadors and basically try to, to bring the mission of of, of the Charney Center around the world through different projects and initiatives. And this is one of the way we're trying to do it by raising awareness about issues of global relevance. And we had our first episode in the, in the summer where our ambassador Benji discussed how we can mitigate climate change and what the youth plays in this role. And today we have a new guest, Xenia, who also just became an ambassador. So I would like to pass on the stage to you and please introduce yourself and tell, uh, tell our public a little bit about you. So yeah, hi, um, nice to see you again. It's been a while and uh, I'm Xenia. I am a graduate of class of 2021 and um, I am currently in Morocco. I'm working here uh, during my gap year for a woman or volunteering for a women's rights organization. And yeah, I'm originally from Berlin and uh, yeah, those are like the basic facts about me. Okay, thank you. And just to ask something a bit more personal, how do you feel now that your MS experience is over and you were kind of thrown into the real world? How does it feel? I mean, I think MS was already like a real world, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I really miss MS. I don't know. It's been, it has been a really special world and I'm in contact with MSers like every day and I text them and sometimes I text them like, ah, I really miss it. Cause really, I don't know, like the things we did at MS and like the comfortability that it gave me is really, really special. Couldn't be more relatable. I feel exactly <laughs> the same way, but it's okay. Life moves on and what MS taught us is still inside us. And on that note, we can introduce the topic of the day which is also very much related to, to MS in a way as well, because we just want to discuss a bit why the youth is not being listened nowadays. So if you could just share a few general statements about, about the topic and why this is something that you're interested and passionate about. Yeah, so why I care about it is I think because I'm a young person myself and so there are many, there have been many moments in my life where I saw that my peers weren't listened to or where people didn't listen to me and I felt like we really had something valuable to share and it was like there was a lack because the youth wasn't listened to and um, why this is happening, I think one big issue is kind of like a cultural thing where we always see youth and like this stage of going to school, going to kindergarten as a stage of just like passively intaking information learning it's not like the real world yet it's not when we have to or when we are supposed to make decisions uh, ask for change it's just like the time where we're supposed to learn and um yeah i think this is one reason why the youth doesn't always feel comfortable to speak up and isn't always listened to and another uh, issue that i see that is like more specific to the place where i'm from in germany um is the demographic change within the population. So there are just much more or many more old people than young people. So it's more in the interest of political parties to do things that are good for the older generations because they're the main um, voters. Uh, yeah, the main voters. Yeah, so this yeah, is, that's my two ideas. This is an interesting paradox of democracy because we're giving a lot more weight to the people who will experience a lot less of the consequences of the political decisions that are being made because we like the youth and especially like even people who are not of voting age so under 18 those are really the ones that will will suffer from consequences especially when like the big old theme of climate change like we will we and especially our kids will be the ones really suffering the consequences 
and so it's it's kind of funny that so much so much power and influence is given to the older generations who feel this this and other topic as less as less close to them and um and so i would like to know you you mentioned something about um where you're from berlin and so i was wondering if before going to ms if you were involved in any student initiative student leadership school council or anything involving youth activism uh yeah i did a couple of things i was um like just really basic uh, the class speaker of my class i was also the student speaker for my school at a point and i also participated in um like there's kind of like this hierarchy of student involvement that i'd li also like to criticize in berlin but where you would then go on and you are the, working as like a student spokesperson for your district and then for berlin the entire city and so i participated in those different instances but also i was part of an organization like kind of like an ngo who work uh, towards um, democratizing uh, high schools all over Germany and uh, improving the participation of young people in political processes, political decisions, especially like towards education. So those are just a couple of things that I did before. Yeah. And and do you feel like in these organizations that you were part of, do you feel like this was actually bringing to a tangible change and were the, the opinions of, of these young very young students how old were you 14 15 like were they actually being listened to or was it more of like a play just to put it out there <laughs> so i think it really dependent on the case and uh, there was always like a big dependency so if there was a really active teacher a really open-minded uh, director then young people young students were able to change something to uh, start a project to maybe even get money and resources for certain things but it there was always this dependency and if there wasn't then like students uh, couldn't really do anything so they had to either be like really nice to their teachers really nice to their director there was always like kind of this relationship that was playing into the activism that we and also other people that i know were able to do and in general like i think uh, like in Berlin, we're at a point now where the po like politicians have realized that it's good to show that they're listening to young people. So they would also sometimes come to different events that we organized um, and they were there and they listened, but quite often it didn't go beyond that stage. So there's like this listening part and it's kind of like, oh, interesting what young people have to say. But then they're like, there's this gap. Very because performative. Nothing done. Yeah. Yeah, and I think another thing that really annoyed me quite a lot of times, because like, for example, in the uh, citywide student council, mm -hmm. we were only able to always just like release press statements, um, just like kind of like publicity work, but there was like no legal possibility for us mm -hmm. to like write a law or just like write recommendations for it. So it's really limited in what students could do. It's mostly just like share their opinions and hope that someone will take them seriously, but there is like no process, no uh, kind of organization where young people can just immediately and actively participate and change. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. And how do you think you would compare the, the structure of youth involvement and initiatives back in Berlin compared to how MS and people at MS try to be involved and try to make a change? <clears throat> so one big difference that I see between uh, the MS structure and the structure that I know from back home is kind of the hierarchy in bit like and the process of, of getting into um, uh, different um, councils that make decisions. So at MS, there are just uh, many different committees and you kind of go there, you go for an interview and then you're either admitted or not. But it's like always a kind of easy interview. It's nothing too scary. It's not like you have to speak in front of a lot of people. And um, I think this just made it much, much easier for people to get in, to think, oh, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little sick. I I'm interested in culture. Let me join the culture committee. Oh, I want to do something for the social part let me join the social committee and this is something that i really liked also <clears throat> uh, at ms still there's a 
the dependency, like whether you get the money or not, whether there is a teacher that will support you or not. But I felt like we were taking much more seriously. But again, it wasn't like written down somewhere as a law or anything. It was just based off these relationships between students and teachers. So this kind of state. But there was definitely like much less of a hierarchy. And um, I think just pretty much everyone could feel somehow comfortable to join those committees. Whereas in Germany, like more privileged students only did that because they had to speak in, a few, uh, in front of a large crowd because the whenever you go into those fancy councils, there's also a specific uh, language spoken, there's a specific mm -hmm. code, how to behave. And if you don't really know that, it's hard to participate and feel comfortable saying your opinion. Yeah, you bring up you bring up an interesting point because I also think the let's call them the barriers to entry, the the system and the leadership at MS were much lower. So instead of having to whatever like candidate yourself for elections and go through all the like social stress and pressure of having to gather votes, it was much more divided and on a more collaborative method and approach. So all the committees were kind of on the same level and there wasn't a hierarchy of, okay, these are the student leaders that decide everything and you all others are below and follow orders. So it was much more mm -hmm. like fluidly collaborative. And that would also like, I guess, incentivize and push people to take part even in smaller projects because they didn't have the feeling that they were taking such a big step and then had to speak in front of everyone and make these big influential mm -hmm. decisions. So it was, definitely a more approachable system so i think mm -hmm. i very much agree on that and that was a good implementation yeah and also i think one thing that ms did well like there's still so much more that ms can improve in that but is to like make time for committees within the school mm -hmm. schedule and i think this is also lacking a lot in the system that i know from back home because like if you want to be active in youth politics you got to do it as like your hobby you, there's no like place within school to do that and that also only lets people like students who have the time to have the resources participate in such things and in ms there was just time provided within the school yeah exactly because i think we all got very used by by going to to a boarding school like ms or in general being in these international student circles we're very used to people that not only like but also have the opportunity to get involved with these extracurriculars and these student initiatives and leadership whatever when that is really not the norm and in mm -hmm. most public schools in like at least most of europe from my experience it most people just go to school as you said at the beginning to passively receive information because they really and this is not their conscious decision, but what society and their parents and people around them tell them is it's just an incubation period. Like now for 15 years, you sit on a desk, passively receive everything we tell them. And then later you can use that information and play the role we want you to have in society. So you follow everything that the system imposed on you. And so we really have to remember to take a step back and realize even though there is there is improvement in both the, the system in Berlin, but also at MS, certainly criticism that can be brought up, we do have to like value just that the intentional time that was made for these type of initiatives and how this should actually be implemented in, in every school and in every in a lot more ways, because as you said, the the youth should really be listened to. And um, did you have something to say? No, I just said definitely. You summarized yeah. that really well. Um, and then maybe going a bit more specific, you mentioned that um, it often, like often young students feel a bit intimidated from stepping up. And what do you think this depends on? And what are like the obstacles that students have to face to actually make their voice be heard? Mm. So I think one thing that's also what I mentioned before is just the hierarchy between students and teachers. So there is like the teacher is the one who has so much more power than the student. And so whenever you especially try to get involved within like a school context, your grades also depend on the person that you might be talking to right now and trying to criticize. <clears throat> so I think this is an issue. And also there's just like a certain like peer atmosphere and you might be in a group that doesn't value <clears throat> when you engage in such things. and 
the group that might be engaging it's in such things is just really different to you so yeah i think those are like kind of the obstacles that come to my mind and how do you feel about like the difference that minorities maybe face in terms of stepping up <laughs> or differences in gender like do you see any any obstacles there um i mean i think they're just like in any other part in society where when you come from a marginalized group you don't really like sometimes you you're not born with like all the skills or like they're not just given to you um how to act in like professional council meeting, how to engage with a teacher, how to engage with a politician, how to speak a fancy language, how to understand all the words. Like I, re I realized in Germany or in German, we always use also the word participation, but their participation, it's kind of fancy. So uh, people who are in, in this like school in, uh, engagement, school involvement context or student council context it's kind of hard for them sometimes to understand instead you could just say another word which is the taligong and that is much i think much easier to grasp but there's just like this is just an example there's like a certain tone a certain language that is created and that makes it much harder for them and it's always also kind of like a power play there are a lot of people who are in such councils who are there to i don't know have their career uh want to feel some power and there is also this dynamic that kind of inhibits good activism yes for sure because i think we always have to remember that like there's not like that the barriers and the um, discrimination that people face in society it's often like it's it's intersectional and so it's combined and it's, it's like you're not only not listened because you're young and don't have the experience but another level is you're listen less because you're a woman or you listen less because you're a minority so you're less represented in the in the mainstream media etc and so all these different identities that mm -hmm. that you hold that you might hold really sum up and then make it very hard and as you said at the end there are very few people that maybe are able to step up in these big fancy student council are the more privileged kids who have less worries and less less other things to worry about um, and so we, we also have to keep that in mind that when we're trying to give more voice to the youth, it should be in an equal way to everyone and not just those who, who are already more advantaged. And um, Definitely. There are also like some examples of young German politicians who are getting into parliaments right now and who just share, for me, really scary stories of what they're told by other politicians who are there and just not taken seriously. And it especially applies to young women politicians, sometimes POCs. And yeah, like it, there's just like, they're really like, they're really condescending tones towards them. And I think um, like what it does to you as a person when you're trying to work on like a matter on a topic and then go always just like attacked for like as a person, then it like, it does a lot to you and it makes it much harder to engage. Yes, of course. And you also, you mentioned the word condescending, which I think we thought about a lot while preparing for this talk, because we've, we've all heard it so many times. It's like these, these older people who are in positions of power, but even just like our relatives or our parents who look at us and are like, oh, you young, cute, smart little boy. Like, it's so nice that you have opinions and you want to change the world, but actually like you don't understand it and it's all much more complex than that and you're not thinking about the economy or whatever and so we always have to face this very like patronizing and condescending tone of yeah nice things but actually the reality is different and that also makes me think of like Greta Thunberg and how so many politicians like use her as the like the way to greenwash their their agenda and they're like yes she's amazing but then they actually don't listen to her and don't really believe that she has the, the right things to bring to the table. Yeah. But, you know, I find that so sad because for our society to prosper, for us to develop, we need to learn from each other and like older and younger generations need to learn from each other. And we also know that older generations have a lot of important things to share with us and we also do with them. So I don't know, like this is at a point where I think I'm kind of like maybe idealistic or naive, but I'm just like, just let's just work together like we could just make it so much better by do we have to be so stuck in our groups and like saying oh the old people oh the young people like uh. 
Agreed, very much agreed. And now, since we touched on this last point of cooperation and collaboration, maybe I would like to ask you if you have any any small step, any advice, any general direction that we as individuals could take to try to give youth the, the voice they deserve and to try to, to make an improvement on this aspect? So uh, <clears throat> I think my first thing, uh, even though I don't like it because I don't see the issue with young people. And so the first thing I should be saying is something to like the structures, but I don't know, just as a young person, I wanna also talk to like, have a message towards young people. And I think it's to like realize that no matter how old you are, no matter what your experience is, your opinion is valuable. And what you feel, what you have to say, what you think is really important. And it's important for you to share. Um, I don't know, I know that quite a lot of times I'm like, oh, I don't know enough about this topic to say something. And it's always important to like, be aware that you don't have all the knowledge, but just like speak up, especially if it's on a matter that affects you, like you have to make yourself heard. And um, I think for like the general structure, there just need to be um, places um, where young people uh, are heard, where their opinion is taken seriously and also always taken towards like the step of how can we act now? What can we do now? How can we take that and do something out of it? And how can we always have young people and young people from diverse economic, social, um, groups um, participate in it. So there just needs to be, I think, a big structural change and also like a cultural change on how we see the youth. Definitely. I think that's that's a good way to sum it all up. And it gave me maybe a little bit more hope, which is not always easy. Um, I think we touched on, on the main points. And so maybe now I would like to step back a little bit and uh, ask you again now that you became an ambassador with the charney center like how do you feel and if you have any ideas on small projects that you would like to be part of or any ways that you would like to to spread the mission of the charney center now that you graduated from emis and you're doing your gap year so first i'm really excited to be an attorney ambassador now and i think it's cool like i was told that ambassadors can pretty much write blogs, write different articles. And so I think this is already like a cool way to where I, I can express what I think, where I can maybe include some other opinions. So I'm really excited for that. Um, I would love to organize an event uh, on like something that we decide on with other Charney ambassadors, because I think now we kind of left MS, we can look back, we can reflect. And also we're in really different like living situations right now. So there's just a lot of knowledge that we can also share with each other. And I'd just love to work with Emma Service again because I really miss them. And um, something that, I don't know, just like a topic, it's also kind of related to what we talked today, um, uh, to what we talked about today, but kind of like uh, that I thought a lot also during MS and also now it's just like the polarization currently in society. I think especially for social media, how we kind of end up in our groups, how we just always talk about the other, the ones up there, the ones down there, the ones next to us, I don't know, something like that. And to do projects that work against that. I think MS did, like gave me a lot of inspiration on how we can combat such kind of thinking because MS just brought a lot of different people together and they were sitting next to each other and they had to talk. And I think this is a really important message that MS sent and inspiration that it gave to me. And I kind of want to take it back home because like, yes, uh, we're not living at home in the same conflict as we lived in at MS, but there are a lot of um, things that are kind of happening in the same way where people don't want to talk to each other, where people don't want to listen to each other. And yeah, this is something I want to do something against. <laughs> I'm very glad you brought that up. And I actually also recognize a lot of what you said in this constant need to, to identify an other and to, to polarize society and to create the vision, etc. cetera. And, uh, and yes, I'd like to share your excitement. I'm also happy the our public will know soon, but we have a few more ambassadors coming up in the next few weeks that also joined our, our network and are also from Xenia's class. And so we're excited to start working on, on new projects and let the voice of the youth be heard. So on this final note, I would just like to thank everyone for tuning in and invite you all to subscribe to our newsletter that comes up every month with any updates about ambassadors about other projects of the charney center as well as subscribing to our social media channels instagram facebook 
etc. You'll find all the links below. And thank you again for tuning in. Thank you, Xenia, for, for being hosted here. And yes, I'm excited for what the future holds for us. Thank you, Jaima, for the interview. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.